Good morning, everyone. It is 11 o'clock and time to begin our webinar. Let's begin with a prayer invoking the, the presence and the, the blessing of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, you taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. And that Spirit, give us right judgment and the joy of his comfort and guidance. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Father Robert Prasuti joining you from Divine Mercy University and Our Lady of Bethesda Retreat Center for this uh, month's seminar, uh, webinar on um, the Spiritual Direction Certificate Program. Let me introduce myself a bit, and then we'll go into the uh, topic of this webinar, which is a very, I think, uh, enlightening topic, just on the whole theme of our own spiritual life and spiritual direction and our path to the Lord. As mentioned, my name is Father Robert Prasuti. I'm a priest um, with the Legionaries of Christ been at Divine Mercy University uh, over the years um, in various capacities in the last few years uh, dedicated to the development of spiritual direction certificate program, which we'll mention a little bit more about it towards the end. And I'm currently stationed also at Our Lady Bethesda Retreat Center right here in the Washington, D.C. area. Speak a little bit about the topic. Um, I think it's a very interesting topic and it might seem even a little bit trite the way it's put together, but I think there's some very deep and important insights um, just about our path with the Lord and uh, God's working in life and history. And I guess it could be taken in so many different levels. So it's entitled God Working Through History, Including My Own. Uh, I would say this is a very relevant theme. We could say it's the most relevant theme, uh, the theme of God. Uh, where he is, how he works, noticing him. Uh, I mean, it's the whole theme of why we were created. Um, it's very interesting that God created us to know him, love him, and serve him, and yet we never see him, at least the way we see other things in this life. And yet he is unmistakably there. So the theme here, God working through history, including my own, in some way touches upon that. And discovering him in my history through spiritual direction. So naturally, we're going to make a nexus here, a connection with spiritual direction. It might be helpful for us to focus on the background of this slide here, which actually might tell us a little bit more than, than meets the eye. I don't know if you recognize it. You'll notice five figures. Obviously, Christ our Lord there right in the center, looking up. And some of you might recognize it. This, this is the Church of the Transfiguration on Mount Tabor in the Holy Land. And this is obviously a very beautiful mosaic, which is in the dome uh, behind the main altar there. Uh, and what do we have here in the Transfiguration? Well, it's an event. It's, an, it's a historic event. It took place. Um, tradition says it's on Mount Tabor. Scripture says it's on a high mountain. And tradition is associated with Mount Tabor. Um, kind of the place of where it took place maybe is, is, is of less importance, but that it took place is very telling. And you'll notice that it took place in a certain moment in Jesus's life. The scripture, we could read about it in the Synoptic Gospels of what was taking place. And it marks a particular moment, and it marks a before and an after. And we can read of the event, Christ manifesting his glory, and the Gospels pick up on particular details on the light, the brightness. Um, the artist rendition here obviously tries to depict that. And there are two figures that are close to Christ. You can kind of notice them in the clouds, and the clouds signify, yeah, they're kind of there mysteriously, because at least in timeline, they're not concurrent with Jesus. The one on the left with the tablet, of course, is Moses, and the one on the right, our right, is, is Elijah. Um, the law and the prophets, uh, that Jesus is the historic fulfillment of the law and the promise and the prophets. So it's very interesting. Jesus is not concurrent 
with Moses and Elijah, and yet Moses and Elijah are with him. Jesus' presence, who he is, kind of ties together past, right? He's, he is the fulfillment of what came before. Um, and what do we speak about what came before the law, the prophets, they spoke, and they had meaning in themselves. The law was how to live here and now and how to be faithful to the covenant of Moses here and now. The prophets, Elijah and so many of the other prophets of the Old Testament, were telling the people how to live uh, in a way open to God and obedient to God in your here and now. And yet, in some ways, not only about the here and now, it was also a promise and openness to the future, right? Moses would say, God will raise up a prophet like me after me, uh, referring to the Messiah, and the prophets obviously prophesied about the Messiah. But it's not only in their specific prophecies about the Messiah, it's in everything they did in some way pointed to Christ, even if they weren't aware of it, even if they weren't noticing what was going on. When Moses was 40 days on Mount Horeb receiving the law, how aware was he? What was really, to, I mean, he was obviously aware he was in the presence of God, an incredible theophany, right? And yet, did he realize he was being made into the image of the Christ? So history works at so many levels here, right? There's, there's the history on the surface of what's taking place, and yet God is working at so many different levels. And the bottom part of the image, what do you see? You see three men. Those refer to the apostles, Peter, James, and John, who went up with Jesus. And the gospel account says that they uh, maybe had fallen asleep or were resting as Jesus was praying. But then they woke up, they were roused, they saw his glory. And Peter, um, you could see Peter, I imagine, is the one on the left because he's speaking there. He seems to be speaking. He has his, his hands out as if saying, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us build three tents. So... It's, it's rooted in the present, in the present moment with those three disciples. Jesus chooses those three. They're experiencing something, yet they realize it's something which is very transcendent. It's in this moment, but it's also out of this moment. It's almost a burst of eternity right into this moment. And those apostles, because of Christ, they're connected with the prophets, with the law. And they are in some way going to bring the law and the prophets to fulfillment. We could think about them. These three are also in some ways the pillars of the church, um, meaning not referring necessarily to the, to the three in the Acts of the Apostles, but the Apostles were going to be the pillars of the church. And our faith, if we, you and I believe today, it's because they lived their life the way they lived and they transmitted to us. And what do they transmit? The life of Jesus. And in the Acts of the Apostles, we read of their speaking to everyone about the resurrection. So in some ways, just in this image, we begin to see so many different layers of how God working in history in a very particular event in the lives of the apostles was a very particular event in the life of Jesus. It was a mystery, and it marks a moment in, in the history of the church. Um, and yet, we, we continue to celebrate the transfiguration, don't we? Every year, August 6th, we celebrate this feast day. And what does it do? When we remember, we're not simply remembering a past event. We're actually reliving, reliving its meaning right here, right now, because this has life in some way. God is, what Jesus does on this mountain, it, in many ways, it, trans, um, it, it trans, uh, translates for us and interprets for us so much of what, was, what takes place in, in our own life. So let's go on ahead, but, but you could see here, this theme is a deeply rich theme when we speak about history, when we speak about God working through history, God revealing himself in history. This slide we already saw. So um, let's pick up on this theme here, the, the description. In the description, what are we saying? Sacred scripture in the history of the church. And when we say the history of the church, we're not only talking about the history of buildings, clearly, not even the history of the spread of the faith. We're talking also about the history of individual Christians because the church is a living body. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. So scripture and the history of the church, our own history in Christ, right? That's the history of the church, teaches us that the Lord God reveals himself through historic events and situations. Let's kind of pause there. Nowhere do we see in sacred scripture God just appearing as he is and 
elucidating a whole series of truths and asking that those truths be transmitted. The closest to that maybe is Moses in the burning bush, I am who I am, maybe where he gives the Ten Commandments. But there is a historic lead up to that, and there's a historic unpacking to that. In other words, God is not just an idea. God is an experience, which can result in certain ideas. What do we mean by an experience? Well, we all have faith, don't we? We want to have faith. What is faith? Well, what do you mean, what is faith? Faith is when you profess our faith, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, created. That's faith, right? Yeah, that's only a part of it. I mean, those truths which we elucidate are important, but those truths come from an experience. And what is the experience? The church that's reflecting on the experience of Christ, who Jesus is, and actually giving it language through the councils, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Chalcedon, and the Council of Constantinople. That's why it's called the Constantinople and Nicene Creed. So in some way, we come to know God not primarily through our thought. And think about what theology is. Theology is not so much our thinking and pushing down ideas of who God is. It's actually our reflecting on experience. This is what theology is. And you study any of the great theologians, especially historically, the, the life of the fathers of the church. What were they doing? They were reflecting on the mystery of sacred scripture and the mystery of Christ, even on their own life, their own experience of God. So sacred scripture and the history of the church teaches that the Lord God reveals himself through events and situations. Isn't this the case in our own life? Why do you believe? Well, I could say why well, I believe because my parents had me baptized. Yeah, but at a certain point, you made it your own. Or at a certain point, you're being invited to make your own. How does that happen? Does God appear to you in a dream at night and say, hey, by the way, you know, your parents told me, you're, you're told you you were baptized. It's me. So, you know, here's what you have to believe. I'm going to confirm to you the creed. I'm going to confirm to you the sacraments. That doesn't happen. And yet we believe. So something better than that actually happens. And what is it? God gently revealing himself through history. Our perceptiveness of what's going on. Um, so this is something very important. You could see here already where our spiritual life is not so much about the truths we the truths we elucidate in our mind. That's an important orthodoxy is important because it kind of helps give voice and proper language to what we experience, which in turn reshapes our experience, right? But it begins with an begins with an event. In Christ Jesus, that event becomes a person. But we'll kind of come to that. So sacred scripture and the history of the church teach us that the Lord God reveals himself through historic events and situations. Are there events and situations in your own life? Hold on to that. The eternal plan of God makes itself incarnate. Does that sound familiar? In persons, events, and the very real situations of, of daily life. We see that in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. We see it in the Acts of the Apostles. We see it in the letters of St. Paul. And we see it above all, where does this reach, reach its height? In the life of Christ Jesus. His life, his experience, the experience of Jesus, that is the revelation of the eternal God becoming flesh. So God is constantly becoming flesh. I mean, what we believe historically took place in God, the word was made flesh. In some way, aren't there images of that already in the Old Testament? And doesn't that keep happening now? Not that Jesus keep, you know, that there's literally new incarnations, but isn't God, Christ Jesus, making himself present? In fact, isn't his ascension is going to be at the right hand of the Father saying, I am with you not only where my physical body is now walking around Israel, but I, everyone has access to me. To go to the Father uh, means to be truly as present to the world as the Father is. So the eternal plan of God makes itself incarnate in persons, events, and the very real situations of daily life. This important truth and insight has deep consequences in our spiritual journey. Let's, let's try to unpack that because it's very deep. It also opens up to deep and consequential insights into the meaning and process of spiritual direction. So um, 
wanted to kind of focus on this image as well too, because this image illustrates, I think, everything we just said. So what do you see in this image? You can see it's kind of an icon, obviously Our Lady with Child there in the middle, but you notice what's around them? It's a ring of fire, isn't it? This is actually the burning bush. I will explain a little bit of the history, but what this is meant to be is the burning bush. So let's kind of maybe hold off on, on seeing Our Lady and the child Jesus there. The figure you see there is Moses. Moses there to the left, Moses to the right. And very often happens in, in icons, you get actually like a time sequence. So it's Moses looking at Moses in different events, different moments in his, in his life. Obviously, the moment of the burning bush is where God reveals himself to Moses. It's, it's a real event. It's a, an historic event. And who are you, Lord? I am who I am. That in itself, just the very title of God, that I am the one who is being and being present and being who I am in the here and now, always present, the eternity of God. That's a deep inside, deep mystery of God. And this event would really, for Moses, obviously mark a before and an after. And what God told him, obviously, go to Egypt. I'm going to send you to free, but you will bring the people to worship on this mountain, Mount Horeb. It was in this mountain where God revealed himself and gave the Ten Commandments. You can see on the top right here, Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. And Moses kind of here in the middle with the sheep, speaking with the angel, refers maybe to all of the times that Moses, the angel of the Lord, would speak to Moses here. So think about this, the event the Exodus event. God marks history through particular events. And God reveals himself through events. In other words, all we need to do is be present in life. And it's in life where God actually reveals himself. Let's speak a little bit about the image of Our Lady and Jesus in the burning bush. This is very, very telling. What does this mean? Whenever God acts, we can never exhaust its meaning. Meaning God, you know, maybe acts in a particular way, but because it's God revealing himself, giving of himself, whenever God acts, God's actions are not just, scripture says, his right arm, but it's God revealing himself. God's actions are him revealing who he is. So who, how he reveals who he is. The fathers of the church recognized in Theotokos, Our Lady, the burning bush. Why? She is the Christ bearer. Christ is the full presence of the living and eternal God. He is the father making himself known through the Holy Spirit, right? He who sees me sees the father. And Mary being the Christ bearer, her virginity, her perpetual virginity, the fathers of the church saw in her the burning bush that was not consumed, a flame in self-giving to God and being the mother of the word and yet not being consumed, her perpetual virginity. Very, very deep and very beautiful, isn't it? On the one hand, it's very metaphorical, but isn't reality itself metaphorical? You know, when we speak about how God created the world and we say that the world is sacramental, everything that God made is in some way a reflection of himself, how much more um, the people and how much more the people that are close to him. So kind of what we're saying here, even the church, the fathers of the church and in them the church, reflecting on this biblical event, this historic event of the burning bush, see in it already uh, the image of Our Lady of Theotokos and Christ coming into the world. Obviously, Christ being the one who's, he is the eternal word. He is the one who is, he is the manifestation of the father. So you can see even going to past events, the things that we thought were one and done, actually with, with great, with more time and more reflection, we continue to unpack its meaning. So this is something very important to kind of sit with. And what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of time? What is the meaning of, of events? Let's take this a little bit further. God reveals himself through history. 
What, did you, what image do you see here in the background? It's the well. It's Jacob's well. Jacob's well, which is itself very evocative. Jacob, the patriarch. Jesus sitting down and the woman speaking to the woman. Who is Jesus? He is the eternal God made man. How does Jesus reveal himself? He doesn't go around with a sign on his back and flashing, you know, God, God in the flesh, God in the flesh. It would seem, well, why doesn't God do it that way? It might seem to be no. He progressively reveals himself. Even in this conversation in the Gospel of John of how Jesus reveals himself to the woman, it's progressive. Why is our Lord waiting? Well, he's revealing himself. Already by asking for water, he's revealing himself. But more and more and more. God reveals himself through history. And eventually this wonderful woman would go back to the town and say, come and meet someone. I've met the Messiah. Come and meet someone who's ever, who told me everything I ever did. And so this is something very telling. Now think about this. Does Jesus sit himself by the well of our life in certain moments, certain situations? We don't even recognize him. He's just there. He even asks for a glass of water, a drink of water. And when the woman um, heard that, it was kind of an additional burden to her. I mean, she came to draw water for herself. And then there's a stranger who wants water. And yet, you know, it, so at times, not only do we not recognize God, at times God might seem to even be a nuisance, doesn't he? So God reveals himself progressively, gradually. This means we really need to be attentive, don't we? We really need to pay attention. And God reveals himself through, re through real, actual events. Uh, this is interesting because you could see that Christianity in its core has the exact opposite movement of what every esoteric religion, every false religion, we can call it kind of the new age-ish, would do. What do they intend to do? They intend to bring us out of our real life to kind of maybe abstract ourselves to some, I don't know, safe place some out-of-body experience, some, I don't know, place that maybe because it's hard to live in reality, we need to get out of reality. Christianity brings us into reality, into the here and now, because that's where God is, through real events. So, you know, Jesus of Nazareth wasn't somebody's beautiful idea. He wasn't somebody's kind of concocted memory. He is real, so real and yet beyond every expectation. So God reveals himself through real events. You know, the resurrection of Jesus, which revealed fully who he was, that was a real event. What do we have here in the background? A young boy with sticks on his back, together with what looks like to be a patriarch. You might recognize this as Abraham and Isaac. And what's taking place here, of course, the scene of, Abraham and Isaac walking towards Mount Moriah, where Abraham is going to sacrifice his son. What? Wow, okay. This, a few things to think about here. Think about how Abraham came to this point in his life. He has a covenant with Yahweh, with the Lord God. How does this happen? Well, it's been progressive in Abram's life. He started out as Abram in Ur. And God telling him, leave the to, to, to a place I will show you. And he leaves Haran, Ur and then eventually Haran and he goes to the land of Cana. And throughout his life, it's just an adventure of friendship with God, different events. I mean, read the book of Genesis. It's wonderful. It's, it's God walking with Abraham and building a friendship with him progressively, slowly. And certain events, and this was very an important, very important event. And God uh, uh, told Abraham, appeared to Abraham and said, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only be son, and offer him in the Holocaust. And Abraham goes and he does it. And read the account in the, in, the, in the book of Genesis. Now let's see what happens is at the point where Abraham is about to sacrifice his son, God stops him. And what's the meaning of this event? Maybe Abraham at this point couldn't understand it. Maybe we can't understand it. But is it God preparing to reveal on that mountain? 
is actually where the lamb is going to be slaughtered, where my own son is going to die, crucified, without wood. And how God prepares us through events. He acts in us through events, but he's also preparing us. So God reveals himself through history progressively, gradually, through real events and with growing awareness, our growing awareness of what's happening. You think you understand your life? You think you understand events? What do we see here in the background? You see Peter here kneeling with the 12, um, with the keys. What this artist depiction tries to show us, Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus just asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And you know the scene very well from the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. Well, Lord, some say Jeremiah, one of the prophets, or John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter responds, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And how did the apostle, how did Peter, and how did the other apostles come to that? They came to it gradually, little by little. This is how God leads us, gradually, little by little. And as our awareness of who the identity of God is in our life, what do you see Jesus doing here to Peter? He's pointing to Peter. He's giving him his keys. Jesus is revealing to Peter his own identity. The more we open up ourselves to the identity of God in our lives, the more we come to recognize and realize our own identity. This is, this is really, really powerful. So it's a gradual revelation through real events with a growing awareness. And as mentioned, an increasing identity and intensity that we come to recognize how truly great the Lord God is. You think you know him? We don't. I mean, we haven't begun to scratch the surface. And you think you know yourself? Who do, you, who do you think you are? Who do we want to be? Do you realize there's a mystery of personhood that you, our identity is not something we forge by willing it. We can't make ourselves. We receive ourselves. You didn't even come into being without your, your willing it. Your identity is going to emerge from your interaction with God and with others. So with increasing identity and intensity. And what do you see here in the background? This is a artist uh, stained glass depiction of the ascension. That the more time went on with Jesus, the more the apostles came to realize who they were. And what their mission was till eventually the Holy Spirit came and you know, and that would continue until the very end of their life. And so this is part of, of how God works. He works through history, through events. He's progressive. So what does this mean? Um, I'm just gonna stop just to share in here for a moment because I think uh I, I think we may want to just for a moment kind of hold all of this together. That, um, that the way the Lord God reveals himself, he reveals himself through history, little by little. It's progressive. We need time to take it in. We need faith to kind of give him the space that he needs to reveal himself. Um, and the more space God has, the more he reveals himself, the more his identity becomes clear, and the more our own identity also emerges. So what does this mean in terms of our spiritual life? What does this mean in terms of, of spiritual direction? How do you hold your experience of God? Memory. Memory. Why did God give us memory? Memory, human memory, is not meant to be so much a data bank. Data. You remember all the data. It's actually a being able to hold on to experience. What does it mean to hold on to experience? It doesn't mean living in the past, but it means keeping present who God is. So what do you see here in the background? Um, well, it looks like an old man stretching, oops, I'm gonna go back, stretching out his hands. This of course is the Exodus. 
where Moses and the people have just crossed the Red Sea. And God told them, you know, the Egyptians are in hot pursuit. And God says, stretch out your hand and let the sea cover them. What was this experience? This was a very important experience in the Old Testament. Why? It forged the people of God. It, it turned the Israelites from a nation into a people of God. This event of fleeing the Egyptians, of leaving Israel, of leaving that land of slavery, walking towards the promised land. And God tells him, remember, remember. In fact, he memorializes it through the liturgical year. He memorializes it through the Passover, which needs to be celebrated every year. Now, what does this mean? Is God just saying, I want you to keep looking at your, I don't know, like a high school yearbook where you're pretending you're still back there? No, 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 no. It's actually, this reveals who I am. I am your liberator. I am your God. And this is who I will always be for you. So remember the canticles of the Old Testament? What are the canticles? The canticle of Miriam and Moses. The canticle of Deborah. The canticle of Hannah. The canticle of Isaiah. The canticle of Zechariah. The canticle of Mary. What does it mean? It's actually reflecting and singing about the great events in which God has revealed himself in our lives. So an important aspect, the church has memory, doesn't it? The liturgical calendar is, is, is a memory. The Eucharist is a memory of what of the Paschal mystery. But it's not only memory, it's not a going past, it's actually an actualizing right here, right now, to such a point that the Eucharist, it's the entire mystery right here, right now. It's eternity in the moment. And this is why memory is so important. What do you remember? How do you hold on to things? What do we hold on to? And in many ways, this is where prayer is very often an exercise of theological memory. Hold on to that, because at times we hold on to what we should let go of, and we let go of what we need to hold on to. Because memory gives us our identity. What we hold on to gives us our identity. Because holding on to the things of God gives us our identity. So what does this also mean? It means perseverance, patience, giving God time to work quickly. God works quickly, but he takes his time. Isn't that a contradiction? No, you've all experienced that. How God at times can do things very quickly and we don't, where did that come from? But you got to give him the space. What we have here in the background, this is Paul preaching in the Areopagus. Okay, um, you can kind of see the Parthenon and various other things there in Greece and Athens, um, and Paul preaching. And what's Paul saying here? You know, he went around, noticed all of the um, altars uh, in the Agora, and he noticed an altar to an unknown God. Well, this unknown God, let me reveal him to you. Here's a particular moment. You know, it didn't go very well for Paul here. He just had two, two converts. But again, his, the patience, the perseverance in doing what we need to do keeping ourselves to our own boundaries and letting God work in history and in our own life and in the life of others. So patience, perseverance, giving God the time and the space. What else? It also means abundant trust and abandonment to the Lord's plan. Giving him the opportunity to weave history together. I'm wondering when Mary was in Nazareth with Jesus those 30 years, did she wonder, when is Jesus going to begin his work? I mean, he clearly outstayed the normal time any Jewish young man would stay. And yet, you know, when he was 28, 29, before he was 30, just giving him the time, giving him the space. He knows. Mary, of course, is the greatest example of this. The Gospel of Luke, Mary kept these things reflecting on them in her heart. What was she reflecting? 2.19, it was after Jesus' birth, his being born in Bethlehem, away from Nazareth, how it all happened. Her reflecting on how just the surprise for her, the surprise for Joseph, the hardship, and then the shepherds coming. Mary turning all these things, holding on to these things, reflecting them in her heart. In Luke 2.51, when they lost Jesus for three days in the temple, such a hard moment. And when they encountered Jesus, why did you look for me, mother? She didn't understand. 
And yet she kept these things, turning them over in her heart. And Jesus afterwards, responding to the exclamation, blessed is the womb that bore you, and blessed are the breasts that gave you milk. Jesus said, no, rather blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. You know, and many, we, we read in that also reference to his mother. Think about these maybe three moments. These are three kind of different pieces of art in the background there of Mary just with the child Jesus reflecting, turning things over. Isn't this an example of prayer? Isn't this an example of a life that gives God the space? And by giving God his space, Mary allowed God to give her her boundaries, right? Imagine, you know, here in this last scene when Mary sees Jesus carrying the cross. Imagine, you know, what any ordinary loving mother would want to do. She would want to weep. She would want to like free her son from all of that. And yet, that's not what God wants. What God is asking of her is to know, Mary, just accompany me, be with me, give me my space. Uh, what does that mean in life? Do we get God's space in our own life? You know, do we try, do we ever kind of crowd God, and, you know, and try to force him into some, some way of action? So how can we practice this? Maybe two particular ways is do you journal spiritual diary? I mean, these are very two concrete ways, right? Already in prayer, we're doing that already in the contemplative spirit, but some have found it very helpful to prayer, to journal. Maybe even doing from time to time a spiritual life map, even kind of even drawing out our life, the events of our life to kind of get a sense, a historic sense of what God is doing. In the background there, by the way, do you know who that is? Another kind of uh, icon. It's an old man writing. This is meant to be John, the apostle, writing the gospels, his gospel. And tradition says he wrote it towards the end of his life as an old man remembering what took place so many decades ago. And yet he has such details. You know, how he must have continued to reflect and unpack the mystery of his life. And it wasn't simply going to the past. He was living it in the here and now. It's very telling that when he recounts his own call, when he and Andrew first saw Jesus, he remembers the time of the day, that it was four in the afternoon. Um, you know, that, that, that hour, that it was the 10th hour. So in this, spiritual direction can have an important role. Why? What does spiritual direction well done do for us? You know, we might go into a spiritual direction, and this can kind of go for spiritual directors and spiritual directees, into a session kind of on what's on the surface, what's going on. But in listening deeply, in reading between the lines, and in going deep, we realize maybe there's something, something taking place, something deep taking place. And spiritual direction can really help us to slow down and kind of really begin to discern in the real sense of that word, to distinguish, to become aware of what the Lord God is doing in our life. At times we can be so frenzied, where is God? And he's right there. So I just want to kind of pause there because we've already been going for 40 minutes. Um, and spiritual direction in many ways becomes the really privileged place to know how to hold things in memory, know how to and begin to really do some deep discernment in terms of deep listening of what the Lord God is doing in our life. You know, why is our Lord, why, why this difficulty? Why am I having this relational difficulty? And this is where spiritual direction is not problem solving. It's not advice given. It's not pastoral counseling. It can include those things, right? But it goes much deeper. It's not about what it's about. But there's something else taking place. Can you hear the Lord? Can you see the Lord? Do you have a call to be spiritual director? Possibly. Do you have the desire to help people keep close to God through the ups and downs of life? Are you moved when you hear other people's spiritual journey? And would you like to help them on their own pilgrimage to believe in God? Are you inspired when you hear of God's closeness and fidelity to his people? And would you like to equip yourself with the tradition, the skills, the virtues, and the coached experience to serve as a spiritual director? 
Divine Mercy University has a very well-developed spiritual direction certificate program. Divine Mercy University itself has a very interesting history of integrating the human sciences with a Catholic Christian view of the human person. And the spiritual direction certificate program takes advantage of so much of that work um, and specifically for spiritual direction. The program involves six courses that are in eight week segments, each offered three times a year. So a student can go through the program in two years. They're fully online except for two residencies. And it integrates, again, Catholic Christian spiritual theology, deep spiritual theology, together with the history of spiritual direction, together with the practical skills needed for that and the coached experiences. Together with this, let me kind of mention something that can also help. Retreats. We all need time to take a step away and pray. In some way, our prayer time is like that every day. But at times, we need retreats, one-day retreats, maybe even longer retreats. Spiritual exercises, the Ignatian spiritual exercises can be a very powerful way of doing those. Spiritual direction. And I just put this up here, here in the DC area. Uh, we're offering that through Our Lady of Bethesda Retreat Center. The URL is there. Uh, and there are also virtual retreats. There are the opportunity of doing extended 19th annotation retreats. So those might be some good opportunities to, uh, to both to grow in our own spiritual direction, perhaps the call to be spiritual director and just in our own, in our own spiritual life. Um, the spiritual direction certificate program is accepting new students. Um, we're collecting uh, applications to start in the spring of 2022. The start of that term is January 5th. Uh, and here you have the URLs to, uh, to Divine Mercy University and to the, uh, to the actual program. I want to thank you all for joining us today. This uh, recording will be available on the Divine Mercy University YouTube channel. And let us end with a prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.